Hi, I'm Manika Raman Wilms, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. Last week, we learned that business negotiations ended up having a pretty big effect on your potato chips. Frito Lay, which makes Lay's potato chips, but also others like Miss Vicky's and Doritos, stopped sending their chips to any of the stores owned by Loblaw. And since Loblaw is the biggest grocer in Canada, that's a lot of stores. There's Loblaws, of course, and No Frills, Value Mart, Povigo if you're in Quebec, even Shoppers Drug Mart. But potato chips are just a symptom of a larger problem here. Today, The Globe's retailing reporter, Susan Koshinsky robertson will break down what the two companies were fighting over and why a lot more of these tough negotiations might be going on behind closed doors. This is The Decibel. Susan, thanks so much for chatting with us today. Thanks for having me. So let's start with these disappearing potato chips. What went so wrong between Frito-Lay and Loblaw that their grocery stores aren't getting these chips right now? So what's happening across the grocery industry is that product suppliers are asking for price increases from retailers. This is across the board right now. Mm -hmm. What's unusual about the situation between Frito-Lay and Loblaw is that it actually became public. Usually these negotiations, they happen behind closed doors. But grocery retailers have been saying that since the summertime, they've been fielding these kinds of price increase requests from most of their product suppliers. And that's because of the factors we've all heard about. Supply chain difficulties, the increased cost of shipping, the increased cost of raw materials, of labor. All of this is hitting product suppliers. And so they're asking for price hikes from retailers as a result. So with this specific situation, then, how much was Frito-Lay going to, to raise the price by? That's a good question. We don't know because these negotiations are confidential. All we know is that they asked for an increase and it was more than Loblaw wanted to pay. And so usually when that happens, the supplier and the retailer will try to negotiate to a number that they both feel comfortable with. In unusual circumstances, what will happen is that the fight will become so protracted that the supplier will actually cut off their shipments to the retailer. And that's what's happened here. Hmm. When I spoke with industry experts, they told me that, you know, a year and a half ago, that kind of a stopped shipment, that would be really, really unusual. But now it's becoming a little less unusual as these conversations are getting more heated. That's interesting. And and you said these are usually things that happen behind closed doors. So why is it that we know about this situation? Well, uh, La Presse actually broke this story last week. And so we don't know who leaked it, but um, it has been confirmed. And someone wanted this to be made public. That's the short answer. Huh. And so what does Loblaw had to say about all of this then? Loblaw doesn't say much about this. They say that these discussions are confidential and that they value their relationships with all of their major suppliers. The company actually reported earnings last week, and every time they report financial results, they have a conference call with financial analysts to talk about the performance of the company. And executives were asked about this mess, and they declined to comment on it. And what about Frito-Lay? What's, what's their side of the story? Yeah, same thing. You know, they just said, you know, they're committed to their Canadian manufacturing and that their products remain widely available. As you you said a little bit earlier, Susan, it's not just about potato chips. We're seeing this one situation happen now, but it's a little bit bigger than that. Rising food prices in, in general there. What other costs for foods have, have gone up recently? Yeah, inflation has been stark lately. So in January, inflation was just over 5%. That's a three-decade high. And that is hitting Canadians' grocery bills directly. Just a few examples, right? Bacon prices, those are up 19%. Condiments up 10%. Fresh fruit is up 5.6%. And just for context, you know, from 2010 
to 2019, the average 12-month increase in grocery prices was just 2%. So this is a big shift, and Canadians are starting to feel it. Again, I mentioned Loblaw reported earnings last week, and they talked about on the call how they're already seeing people change their behavior. They own no frills, and they're starting to see customers move their shopping from these conventional grocery stores where they really flocked during the pandemic because people were trying to limit their outings by seeking out a one-stop shop. So they were headed to the conventional grocery stores a lot more often. But now Loblaw is seeing people go back to the discount stores to try to offset some of those pressures. So the impact on Canadians' pocketbooks is real. Does it just come down to inflation then? Is that really the, the main reason behind these this rise in, in cost? Yeah, it does. Um, but when we say inflation, we have to remember that it's a number of different elements, right? So, you know, on the call last week, so Loblaw's chief financial officer, he talked about the prices that you see on the shelves being the end of a long chain, right? The supply chain and the performance of the company was quite good, um, you know, Grocery sales were up 1.1%, and that's not much. But when you think about it, that was keeping pace on a comparative scale to a period in 2020 when things jumped by 8.6%. So they're keeping pace with a pretty high level of grocery sales. And um, just for context, you know, this is an industry where for years, a couple of percentage points of growth, that was good. This is a really unprecedented time for the grocery retailers in terms of the growth that they've seen in the last two years. It's, I'm trying to figure this out exactly, because if food costs more for stores like Loblaws to buy, I, I would imagine that would be eating into their profits. But that's not the case, it sounds like. It's not the case. Um, if Loblaw executives talked about it last week, said that they've so far been successful passing through those cost increases. And what that means is they're passing it through to the price that customers pay. Uh, that's what all retailers do when they face price increases. It's interesting, after they reported their financial results last week, I heard from the head of an industry group, uh, Food, Health and Consumer Products of Canada, who represents many of the packaged goods manufacturers, who pointed out that, you know, these were very strong results and, you know, they are generating significant profits while customers are facing real inflation. Okay, so if Loblaw is doing so well then, I mean, why don't they just pay a little bit more for those Lay's chips and, and keep them in the store? Why don't, they, why don't they just do that? You know, that's a really good question. I think that they would say that they are doing their part by trying to keep prices low, but you're not going to see them eating the cost of this when they don't have to. That's part of how they run their business. It's part of how all retailers run their business. If they don't have to take out margin, when prices rise, they're not going to do it. It's just the sad fact of it. So they're doing their you know, fiscal responsibility for whatever that's worth. And they are, generally speaking, passing on that cost to customers. So, Susan, if this is an issue at Loblaw, this must be an issue for other grocery stores and chains as well. Are other stores facing the same kind of decision where they're looking at maybe not being able to carry certain foods or, or certain brands? Yes, absolutely. This is across the board. No, no question. Loblaw has extremely good bargaining power in the industry. Uh, it's a major, major retailer. It controls a big swath of the Canadian grocery market. That's not to say it doesn't have major competitors, right? It competes against Costco. It competes against Walmart, uh, Empire, the company that owns Sobeys and Safeway, Metro. So there's a lot of competition in this sector for sure. But Loblaw is a really big player. So if they aren't able to negotiate a supplier down, it only stands to reason that other retailers are having the same issues. And they've said they're having the same issues, for sure. So when I speak to industry experts, they tell me, you know, this is really just the tip of the iceberg, that we could see more instances where suppliers stop stocking the shelves. And we won't necessarily hear about it the same way we heard about this one. We'll just notice gaps in the shelves. 
is it fair to think of this as like a temporary thing where at this point we can't get these brands, but at some point, again, they will become accessible in these stores? I think it's likely that it's temporary, and especially because Loblaw knows that if people are really dedicated to buying those Lay's chips, they can walk down the street or they can drive a short distance away and they can get them, most likely, Mm -hmm. at a Metro or at a Soapy's. So they still have to compete, and national brands are still important there. Um, It's interesting that Loblaw does have its own private label brands. So keep in mind that when a national brand like this stops shipping, you're going to see Loblaw promoting things like no-name chips. And the investment that retailers have made in those private label brands, particularly in recent years, also complicates this conversation because they have a lot of visibility into those costs because they also manufacture products. So they're able to use that knowledge, not to mention the knowledge that they glean from other suppliers, from the fact that they have a lot of customer data. They have a lot of negotiating power here. So eventually this will get resolved, but In the meantime, it's not as though you won't be able to get potato chips. It just will depend on how flexible you are in terms of your variety. Hmm. Yeah, this I mean, and that's kind of something that we've seen when we're talking about these supply chain issues, right? It's like you might not be able to get your specific brand of cereal, but there will be cereal available. Is, Is that kind of the idea? That's right. That's what retailers have been signaling this whole time. It's also interesting that, you know, this dispute is happening at a time when the industry has been talking a lot about the need for a code of conduct to govern the relationship between retailers and suppliers. And that code of conduct, um, which is in the works and has been a subject of discussion, would provide for a dispute resolution process. Now, industry experts tell me that it would be unlikely to solve a problem like this entirely if this popped up under a regime where there was a code of conduct. But it's an interesting bit of context because these negotiations, they happen all the time. And the retailers and their suppliers in this part of the industry have fought before and they'll likely fight again. This is fascinating because this is stuff then that's going on behind the scenes all the time. And and we now know about this because this chip dispute was kind of made public here. And this code of conduct that you're 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 mentioning, Susan, is this for Canadian grocers, Canadian suppliers or like, I guess, who's talking about this? This is for the Canadian industry specifically. So it's still not been created. It's something that's just in discussion at this point. But it follows the model of markets like the UK, where there is a grocery industry adjudicator who can deal wow. with these kinds of disputes. Um, and again, it's not as though that adjudicator has total power over the industry. That adjudicator can't settle necessarily a negotiation. But the idea of a code is to create certain practices in the negotiations between retailers and suppliers that they would have to follow. So it'll be interesting to see where those discussions lead. And I guess to just take a step back here at the end and, and look at the big picture of, of the cost of food, because we've been talking about the you know what's available at the supermarket. And for most of us, it's going to be a little bit of an inconvenience, a little bit of a higher price here or there. Um, but for some people who are living on the edge, I mean, this could be a, a big deal in, in their, their cost of food prices. What do we know about how how significant these increases across the board are going to be, especially to affect, you know, lower income families? Yeah, that's a really important point. You know, nobody's going to go hungry if they can't get their potato chips, right? But potato chips are just a symptom of a larger problem here. Uh, You know, already people have been hit financially during the pandemic. And in the last couple of years, Food banks in Canada have said that they have seen an uptick in visits from Canadians who are finding themselves food insecure, and they have seen an uptick in demand for their services, and that uptick is continuing. And further inflation really only exacerbates that problem. You know, the price of groceries is already out of reach for some families, and with prices still going up, it's one thing to miss out on a treat like a potato chip, and it's another thing not to be able to afford meat, vegetables, fruit for your family. Susan, this was really interesting. Thank you for speaking with us today. Thanks so much. That's it for today. 
I'm Manika Raman-Wilms. Our producers are Madeline White and Cheryl Sutherland. David Crosby edits the show. Kasia Mihailovich is our senior producer, and Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.